Hello, welcome to episode five of the Villa Together podcast and joining me this week on once again with Ian Gillett and returning this week is Joe Davidson. How are we doing guys? How are you doing Chris? Great to be with you again. Nice to see you Joe. Cheers guys, good to be back. Good to have you back. Um, so since last week, um, there's been a bit of transfer news, shall we say. So moving on from last week, where me and Ian went into detail about Matty Cash, um, as at that forest, um, and very briefly, obviously, though, look at it in detail. Um, last week's episode, we discussed it, but. I think me and Ian looking at it um, seems like we're going to get a, what is going to be a decent right back at the club. Um, he has played central midfield. He, he has played on the wing. He's a converted winger to right back. He's going to be our first choice right back. But we mentioned last week, Ian, I think he's, um, his willingness, his desire and his, his work rate down the right wing, um, plus his, his improvement passing-wise, in particular over Gilbert, is going to be a pretty good signing, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. We looked at that the energy that he's going to bring to that right-hand side and specifically we looked at the heat maps um, and the amount of ground that he covers is really impressive. And then looking at the stats with regards to um, over 75% in his sort of passing accuracy, um, it's, it's going to be a great signing for us and um, we're glad to have him on board. Um, and I think there's been another one through the door today, which is also good news. But yeah, on Matty Cash, very happy to have him here. Um, we looked at it all in detail last week. So if you want to go and have a look at that pod, feel free to tune into that one and go over the stats that we looked at and in particular on Matty Cash. But yeah, very happy to have him here. Um, just want to get you, get your thoughts on, on the signing, Joe. Yeah, very happy with it, to be honest. Um, I think he provides a far more balanced... Uh, right back option. Um, the problem we had last year, we either had Elmo, who, to be fair, was our best fullback, but he's getting on a bit now, and in reality, he can't play every game anymore, particularly at this level, which is kind of understandable at 33. Um, but when we played Gilbert, we were so unbalanced. And as you said, uh, looking back even further, the heat maps we used in episode two, all of our attacking play came off the left-hand side. Every time we went off the right, we lost the ball, meaning we were completely out of, out of shape constantly. And it made us very one-dimensional. I think with Matty Cash coming in, his defensive stats are pretty good, to be fair. He's, um, he commits a lot less tackles per game than Gilbert, but he tackles at a much higher success rate. He's far, in terms of tackling and sort of the aggressive nature of his play, he's far more in line with the rest of our back line as well. I think the combination of the um, extra attacking impetus he has over the other options and being more sort of tactically suited to our back line than our current right back options makes him, to be fair, a very good fit. And for the price paid, I think, seems very reasonable. Um, particularly when you consider he's only played as a right-back once uh, for one season now. So it's, I think we can expect a reasonable amount of growth pretty quickly from him in that position. Yeah, hopefully. I think, as we touched on last week, he, he does offer quite a fair bit of improvement in certain areas. Um, I mean, you mentioned it a few weeks back on episode two about Gilbert's passing and how that left us unbalanced and the, the breakdown on the right-hand side. So going from, I think, Gilbert's 67% uh, pass completion to Matty Cash, which is around 75 76%, it is a, it's a pretty big improvement in all fairness. Um, so I think it's going to be a good one going forward. And obviously, as Ian's mentioned, um, we had another man for the door today, which is Ollie Watkins, a uh, fee of £28 million from Brentford. Um, again, another player that we've previously touched on. We mentioned him episode two. Joe went into detail um, about Ollie Watkins and, and what, what he brings and, and strengths, etc. So anyone wanting to look at that, have a look on 
uh, YouTube, episode two, in-depth detail for that one. But those guys watch on YouTube now can see a little video of him, a uh, compilation of his goals from last season. Um, but joining us now, what we've got is a very special guest who knows a bit more about Ollie, Ollie Watkins than the rest of us. So just going to hand over to him. Hi, guys. My name is Greville Waterman. I'm a Brentford fan. I'm part of the Besotted uh, podcast crew. I also write a blog on the Brentford. I've written a few books on them. So uh, that's me. OK, so thanks very much for coming on. Very much appreciated. Um, as, I, as, as I've just said to you, we, we, what we wanted to do was get a, a Brentford fan's perspective on Ollie Watkins. Because obviously today he's completed a £28 million move to Aston Villa from Brentford. Um, do you want to just give us a, a, an overview of Ollie Watkins' his strengths, yeah. weaknesses if there are any, style, style of play um, and, and anything else basically just to, just to inform everyone? Just to let you know, there's some very good compilation videos of him uh, knocking around YouTube. In fact, there's like a farewell two minute on the Brentford website, the visual website. It's worth seeing because it shows his versatility. Basically, he came to us three years ago as a left winger from Exeter City. He had a, two or three years there. He's 24. I think he's 25 in December. He's just under six foot. He's an athlete, but he's a footballer. He's quick. He's two-footed. He's good in the air. Um, he had two very good seasons coming in from the left wing. Played the odd game up front, but, you know, he was behind Neil Mope. And believe me, Neil Mope, as you well know, to your cost. I think he got three goals against you in two games and a really nice get. Should have had a red card as well. Um, he got ten goals each season or so from the wing. Uh, Mope went to Brighton a year ago. All the deals we they'll they'll tell you the Brentford will say well we always knew Ollie Watkins was going to be our number nine uh, not really uh, he was always there as a backup all the deals we we had fell through we were left with him and he took to it like a duck to water he is he's turned really into the complete number nine and I'm gushing but he was that good um, he got what twenty six goals the good thing about it is he got pretty much an equal amount with right foot, left foot and on head and in his head on his on his head. He scored a majority of them within the six yard box as well, which took us by surprise because that was Mope's strength. Um, what is also very good is he's strong. He's not a battering ram. He's not an Andy Carroll. You're not gonna hammer long high balls up to him because um, he'll lose a lot. But if you, if you get the ball into his feet or even into his chest He'll get you up the field, he'll hold you up, he'll hold the ball, he'll turn, he'll bring your wingers, if you have wingers, but, which is something I'll come on to in a minute. Um, you know, you're, you're going to need you're gonna need Graylish or El Ghazi or somebody to provide him with service. Uh, he can't do it all on his own. He can do a lot on his own. He's never played a minute in the Premier League. Now, that's something that is a concern, would be a concern. Um, but really, he was the complete striker last year. Um, I don't know if any of you see, have seen any of his goals, but it was a complete variety of goals, and he was consistent. Yeah, he missed a lot. I mean, he could have had 40 or 50. We created that, that many chances. But he was lucky also in that we played 4-3-3. Um, what were you playing in the last season? Was it 4-3-3 or about that? Yeah, yeah. for the majority of the season, we, we played 4-3-3. We did tinker with a 3-4-3. Three, three. Um, yeah. We played it a few times, but... But on the whole, it was a 4-3-3. So I'd imagine we'd carry on with that because that's how we ended. Well, that's what he needs because he's he's used to playing up top on his own. Uh, but he was supported by Ben Rama on the, on the left, Mabuemo, Brian Mabuemo, I don't know if you've come across him yet. And they got, I think, yeah. 59 goals between them. The BMW, the fabled, the fabled BMW. Now, you've got the W. We'd very much like you to have uh, the B as well. We could probably sell you Ben Rama for another 20-odd million. Actually, you do you a lot of good. But he needs support, and Mabuemo particularly would come in from the right and Lily almost become a second centre-forward occasionally. But he's just got it. It's as simple as that. Um, he, is, he, he doesn't hide away from home. He puts himself about. Uh, he doesn't get booked very often. He's very calm, even-tempered doesn't lose it 
Um, he just was the perfect centre forward in the championship. You've got to agree with that. So he's untested, but he's two footed. If you give, you know, it's not like Scott Hogan. I'm, I mean, am I allowed to swear on your program? So I'll say Scott Hogan. Um, <laughs> yeah, Scott cool. Hogan was very much somebody who plays, and, and I don't know what went wrong with him, but at Brentford, we, he played off the shoulder of the last defender, and we had the players in Canos, even Josh McEachran, that's another swear word, that could actually get him in on goal. And he was deadly, absolutely deadly for us. God knows what you turned him into or what happened, what went wrong and whatever. Um, he's not, uh, Ollie's not like that. Ollie will actually con contribute to your play as well. He does come back. He's, he, he sort of gets in the way a bit when he defends, uh, conceded a couple of penalties with sort of naive pulling people back in the box. But he, he's very quick. Did any of you see um, any of the playoffs uh, in the last season? He beat Swansea yep. in the second leg of the playoff. And he got a goal yep. that was just unreal when Jensen put like a 50-yard ball, sort of cut the, cut the Swansea defence in two. And he just ran from halfway. Nobody could get near him. He's quick and finishes. Yep. And he's clever because he shot early before the keeper set himself. Totally two-footed. Um, if you can actually... I don't know if you'll play Grealish, Grealish wide or if, if we can, Grealish will be with you or whether he will play in the hole as a number 10. If you can give him service, he will get you 15 goals next season in the Premier League. That's, that's my, you know, that, that, that's my tip. That's, that's what I say he will do. I can't believe the money we've got for him. Um, you know, people are saying 27, 28 million down plus another five to come. And obviously that will be on goals on you staying up. Um, if he gets you 15 goals, it's, great. it's money very, very well spent. But, you know, in the past, we've sold you, we've sold you Hogan. He was good for us. So, we, you know, I don't know, as I said, I don't know what happened to him. Konza, not sure about him. Um, I suspect you'll probably say the same about Konza. Um, and obviously, you've got Hotter via another team who you're not allowed to talk about. Um, but this guy is the real deal. And, I, and, you know, we love him. We like him. We trust him. We respect him. And, you, you know, when players go and you think, good luck to you, mate. Um, he, yeah. he gave us, you know, it's the Brentford philosophy. You probably all know about the Brentford philosophy. I won't bore you with it, but it works. You know, yeah. we bring the players in. We identify people that others perhaps right. didn't, although Ollie Watkins was obviously a known entity at Exeter. We have incredible coaches and one-on-one -on -one attention. You know, we really nurture them. And that's more than most, like most teams do. We give them the freedom to play because we play attacking football and players like that shine. And it was his turn. You know, he gave us three years. Candidly, he's at the top of the market. You've paid top market for him. You paid more than we expected. I think we were expecting about 23, 24 for him. Uh, directors of football might disagree, but I suspect that's sort of where they were. Um, and we wish him nothing but success. And I think if you give him the support and the service and the freedom, he will he will certainly keep you up next season or contribute to that. And I don't know what your ambitions are for the year, um, but he will help you fulfil them. Is that gushing enough? Yeah, That's no, great. very, very good. Um, our episodes, we love it. And um, Joe went into to detail about Ollie Watkins uh, mm. his strengths and, and stuff like that so we've looked into him and I think for, for certainly us guys here he was towards the top of our list mm. in terms of player that we wanted at the club um, touching on a couple of things that you mentioned I think in terms of the fee I think it probably is a bit too much only slightly a bit too much mm. but I think I think a lot of us Villa fans can understand that from if, if we apply it to Jack Grealish, for example. Jack Grealish in the mar in the current market when looking at attacking midfielders, he's, he's not going to be as much as he's worth to us as a club. Mm. I suppose this, the same is probably for you guys, Ollie Watkins, that as a top-end championship striker, um, probably isn't worth as much as he will be to you guys in terms of being able to replace that player in a team that was one of the best teams in the league last year and would 
hopefully be again fighting for promotion. So I can kind of get that. But we've already, thing... we've already we've already replaced him. We replaced him before oh, yes. we sold him. You know that, that's what we do. Um, we've we've replaced him with somebody who I believe. You know, if I if I'm guessing, and my guess is normally reasonably accurate. Um, Ivan Tony's probably cost us about six million down, and another four or five to come. Um, so yeah. it's you know a third of of what we got, and that's what how we do it. And you know we've taken a bit of a gamble because this guy's yeah he has played in the Championship. I think he played in the Premier League for Newcastle. But you know yeah. it's sort of the succession strategy. Um, yeah, you you might have overpaid for him, but it's market forces. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think. I Sorry to interrupt you, Chris. I think uh, that pretty much sums it up with the um, evident interest from Spurs and a number of other Premier League clubs. Yeah, we probably did end up paying an extra couple of million for that. Mm -hmm. I think um, considering the profile of player, considering his versatility and the way he fits into the Brentford team and has the potential to do the same for us, I would argue around that sort of price seems fairly reasonable for us. We can afford it. And I think it works out as a reasonable deal for both sides. I hope so. But you've got to play to his strengths. I mean, you know, if you played 4-5-1 and left him up there on his own, you know, when you go away from home, if you just literally played two banks of four and someone and Graylish and then him, you're not going to use him to his best. You know, he, he's got to have someone with him. He's got to have some support. Not a, not a, dual, not a second striker. But he's got to have support up the wings. Um, you know, you've got Matty Cash in. Matty Cash is a superb attacking fullback. Can't defend to save his life, but he's an attacking. He's good. He's very, very good. And I think that he will. He and Ollie will will um, work will gel well together as well. So use him right. Don't waste him. Um, he goes with our love, literally and best wish. He was just great. And we're a community club, and he just slotted in i mean i'm very friendly with the people that run the the community side of brentford and he was you know for what it's worth he was the the top pick he was always he was the one that always did all the the visits and the hospitals and the the disadvantaged kids and everything else he's just a lovely guy he's just he's, you know he's got he's, he was well brought up he's he, he's got manners and respect uh hopefully he'll he'll you know he won't he won't get spoiled you know, you won't find him. You won't find him in a dentist chair. You know, um, consuming all the. You know, out for illegal raids and everything. He's, well, hopefully, hopefully not. He's just a good guy. He's a good guy and a great player. And I'm gonna stop gushing about him. But I'm proud. You know, we all we all wanted him to go. Yeah. We didn't want to keep him, to be honest, uh, because if we'd have gone up, and we should have gone up, but that's another story. You really don't want to go into. Um, we might have kept him, you never know. But for, on a pound, shillings and pence basis, he would never be worth more to us than he is now. And frankly, the deal's proved it. And I'm not gloating, it's just how it is. You know, um, I can't believe Tottenham would have, because you know what Tottenham are like, Tottenham would never have paid anywhere near what you've paid. Um, West Ham, I, I, there's talk that West Brom wanted to sign him on loan with a buy, with a buy clause in a year's time, which is just ludicrous. So, you know, you've got him, you use him well, you've got to get players up the pitch and support him, you've got to get the ball in the box, you've, you've got to try and get him in behind as well. I mean, Brentford play with a very, very high line, I'm not sure if you do, probably not, and again, that gives him the, the opportunity to get him behind the other teams, um, and he's, is he clinical? Not particularly, but, he, you know, he'd get, five, he'd get five chances a game at Brentford. You'll probably yeah. get two with you. That's not, you know, that's probably a fact of life. Yeah. Um, and if he can put, if he, yeah, I, I, my guess is somewhere between 12 and 15 goals. He doesn't take, don't let him anywhere near penalties. Um, he has, he scored one out of four for Brentford. Um, so don't let him anywhere near, don't let him anywhere near them because, um, you know, he'll hit, he'll hit them out of the ground. Um, but anyway, <laughs> anything else about him? You want to know? The one, the one thing, um, but I was thinking of because is it going to turn out to be another Scott Hogan? Um, and I think for every Scott Hogan, okay, and the other player isn't linked to us, but 
Or could it be another Neil Morpoy? Now, Neil Morpoy obviously left you guys, went to Brighton, had a reasonably decent season last season. I think he got 10 goals yeah. in the league. Yeah, so, yeah. so th- those three strikers, I suppose they are they are different in their own ways. Who would you, out of those three strikers, who would you say is the best striker, and why do you think that he didn't work? Well, they're all, it's, it's, it's sort of, well, I was I was going to ask you exactly the same question. You know, I was going to say to you facetiously, how did you manage to ruin Scott Hogan? And, and I mean it seriously because he was he the way he played at Brentford. He didn't contribute a thing. He didn't press. He didn't come back. Uh, in fact, we were a lot better without him. He scored the goal. He got, I think, 15 goals for us in half the season. And he was very clinical. But literally, he was, you know, remember in the playground, the goal hanger. That's what he was. And we'd get him in behind. And he was clinical. He really was clinical, except penalties. Um, and in fact, as soon as he went, we, we never replaced him. Literally, we didn't replace. Yeah, we replaced him with a winger, Sergi Canos, and we played with Lassie Viva. You know, we got tw- and Ho- we had oh, then we had we had Dear Hotter, and Hotter was superb that season, and we got many more goals without him. So I've got no idea. What, 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 I'll ask you, what went wrong with with um, Scott Hogan? I think um, this has been a number of years now. The, the way we play, and it hasn't massively changed. Obviously, the style of play has changed, but yeah. the need for, a, for a, a bit of an all-round striker hasn't massively changed over the last however many years. That's why when you look at the strikers we've had over the years, um, I'd say that's five years, Tammy Abraham has probably been the best of what is a bad bunch because he, he's got a bit more of an all-round game than the others. Yeah. You you could see when Scott Hogan played that he didn't really offer anything else apart from the run behind and we didn't see it enough but the finish. You're spot on. You're spot on. But we needed that all-round play to link up everything because I think we bought him at a time when we were still in transition in the championship. Um, I think Steve Bruce bought him in and didn't really know how to use him. Um, And we haven't massively changed from needing that all-round striker. So I think I think that's why we've gone for Watkins because he does have, even though it's not a main strength of his game, he does have the ability to play at times with his back towards goal because he does have right. that strength. No, you're right. Now, and that that's not Hogan's game. And if, if that's if that's what you needed, you were bonkers. Down to the ground. Because Neil Mope is evil little bastard, very bright guy. He's actually an incredibly well-spoken, intelligent man. Um, yeah. But on the pitch, he's horrible. And you know, as, um, who was it? Was it was it McGinn who he, tra- he trampled on, or was it we? I can't remember. He, tra- he trod on one of your players last year, who actually did something pretty nasty to him first that the cameras didn't pick up. But you know, he he um, would get his retaliation in first. He didn't realise since it was a live game, there were cameras everywhere. Um, Mopé's strength were, strengths were in the six-yard box, very, very good, very cold in front of goal, very calm, two-footed again. Um, but where he is better than Watkins, doesn't have Watkins' pace, he hasn't got Watkins' power in the air, uh, but he holds the ball up beautifully, and he's five for eight, for Christ's sake. And he was... Who did you have? Was it Courtney House and Chester? I can't remember who you had. No, who was the other centre-half? Was it Huddersfield? Um, you, you had Elphick. Elphick. Yeah, Elphick. And Mope would give... He, he's, what, five inches towards... He's five foot eight. He's six inches smaller than your guys. And he was bullying them. Literally bullying them. And it was very funny. Uh, probably very worrying for you guys. He could do it. So his strength was actually holding the ball up and he was absolutely brilliant at bringing the two wingers into play. He would literally get the ball on the halfway line, turn and play a 40-yard ball out to the wing. And he was in the area waiting. And that's how he got a lot of his goals. Ollie is decent at that. Not quite as strong, funnily enough, even though he's six foot. Um, but is uh, better in the air. And yeah, he's, he's as good a finisher. So, you know, I know you were interested in Mope at one time. Ollie is a very, very, very good signing for you. You know, he, he will, he will. If you get, if you play him right, he will do well for you. 
Yeah, I think um, I think it was uh, the price, the fee quoted for more pie, which I think put us off. And I think the difference this season is that last season we needed a lot more players for our squad. Yeah. yeah. So now where we're looking at maybe four or five, you know, better players. Last season we were looking for more squad fillers. Yeah. So I think it's exciting for us. Like I said, we we, we looked into some detail at Ollie Watkins a few weeks ago. Joe went into detail about Ollie Watkins and his strengths and stuff like that. And, and we all were of the opinion that he was going to be a good signing. We'd, we've obviously been linked all summer, but I don't think we... I don't know, I think because it had dragged on so long, there, I think an element of doubt had crept into the, the mm. head of most most Villa fans. But, I mean, I, I'm happy. I suppose you can, you can, you can say the old cliche, it's not my money. Um, you know, and it's not, and I don't really, I'm not really too fussed about what we've paid. A, a friend of mine, um, he's a professional footballer and he used to play uh, for Exeter and he played volley. Um, What's his I name? To him, uh, Alex Nichols. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sent forward, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I spoke to he Alex to about it. He went to Warsaw, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, well. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I yeah, spoke yeah. to him about it and he, and he said, yeah. um, he said he said Ollie would be a, be a good player because because he's got that he's got the right attitude. Yeah. Aside aside from everything else that people see and, and can look into, he said he's got the right attitude because he wants to do well. And I think going into the Premier League, he's going to want to prove yeah. himself. Isn't yeah. It? So he's the right age. You know, he's had three good years in the Championship, and you know it's a tough. You well, you know it's a very 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 tough league. And he's had three really good years there. He's grown as a player. He's really confident. You know, he knows he's good without being arrogant. Um, and I, I just can't see you losing with him. I, I really, really can't. Do I wish he'd gone somewhere else? Well, I don't know. I mean, I wanted somewhere where he'd play every week. Um, I'm slightly concerned about Villa in terms of the style. Uh, I mean, Dean Smith will want to play attacking football last year. He had his, you know, pants taken down, you know, and I think he did really well to stay up in the end. But hopefully this year, it will, you know, you'll, you'll be able to give him the support he needs. And as I say, we've got a, a little Algerian winger called Saeed Ben Rama, who hasn't got his move yet, which is interesting. And he's a player. He's a real player. He would fit in with you. Yeah, we mentioned him, didn't we, as well? Um, Joe mm -hmm. went into detail about him. I think he, he, he probably was at the top of, top of our list as well, wasn't he, in terms of wingers? Mm. Yeah, we'd uh, put him alongside Rashidza as our top two choices, I think. Who was the other one? Uh, Milo Rashidza, the Verde Bremen oh. left-sided winger. Yeah, OK. Take you... <laughs> <laughs> I think um, no, the winger will definitely be the next one on the agenda. There's big rumours around a goalkeeper as well, but I think uh, in terms of our areas that we need to develop on the pitch, the winger is definitely the next priority um, for a lot of... Uh, I, think, I think a goalkeeper... I mean, how long before you get Heaton back? He's, he's back in um, full training now, but um, they don't reckon he's going to be ready until sort of midway through October. So I think we're looking for somebody to push him for the number one place um, going forward. There's been big rumours with um, Martinez from Arsenal um, and also a, a few rumours around Manchester United, Sergio Romero. Um, yeah, that's not bad. I mean, there's, you know, Arsenal want to sign our keeper and because they, they know they're going to sell one of Lino or Martinez, uh, but we're trying not to sell him. David, David Raya, who's pretty good. Um, plays as a sweeper, really. He's a sweeper keeper. But yeah, you definitely need a new keeper after what I saw, you know, after Heaton got injured last year. Um, you know, um, I remember seeing Nyland against Brentford. That's right. You, you had Nyland in the two-all draw where what he didn't miss, he dropped. But then he made two incredible saves at 2-1 to keep you in it when you equalised in about the 120th minute um, of a 90-minute game. Um, and then you had the other tall, was he a Croatian or whatever, who was at Brentford, yeah, who was not, incredible, not incredibly immobile, massive, but he just looked so stiff and, I don't know, is he still with you? Yeah, struggling. Probably, to earn, probably earning about 30 grand a week and just for doing nothing. 
Um, yeah, well, you know. Um, yeah, but anyway, Ben Rama's sitting there. For some reason, he hasn't got his move. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Um, anyway, that's all I can really tell you, I think. Um, I, I'd love him to get a quick... Uh, who's your first game? Sheffield United at home. We've got an um, extra few... Uh, yeah. Because of the European games and uh, the Man City. So when is it? So when, when's your first game? 21st of September. It's a Monday so you've got, night you've, now. Right, you've got, you've got an extra week because we play this week. In fact, we're away at Birmingham. Please do not loan them Scott Hogan between now and Saturday because he will score against us. Um, <laughs> is well, he likely to get rid of him? But yeah, we'll drag it out for you for another week. Yeah, or yeah. So if we, and, and the other if one, in all seriousness, is Hotter for a couple of years with us was sen sensational. Genuinely sensational. Um, and I've seen him and he looks a shadow. He just looks a, sh he just looks a shadow now and I, I, I don't understand it. I really don't because that guy, could, and it's not to say because he's in the Premier League, that there's some, it, it's, like, like, it's like a light has gone out. I don't know. That, that guy was a little maestro. Um, all left foot, no right foot whatsoever. Um, would always come inside, but it's gone. I think. Um, am I am I being unfair, or have you never seen you haven't seen anything from him either? Uh, no, you've not been unfair. I don't think. I think, um, like you said, um, we we don't know if it's the step up to the Premier League and and sort yeah. of one of the sort of major weaknesses is his strength. But he has got an eye for a, a through ball, and, and we saw it in the <laughs> early stages of the season when he slotted Everton in. Wesley threw it in the Everton home yeah, game. Yeah, correct. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't think he um, is part of sort of the master plan going forward, apart from being a, a squad filler and somebody to bring off the bench in the, the last few minutes. Uh, you, you, have a mar you have a master plan then? <laughs> We're hoping so now. <laughs> we haven't Listen. had one for years, but... Um, Listen, we, we're, we're, very, we're, we're very fond of Dean Smith. He's a good guy. Um... And he's done, I think he's done a, a very good job. Um, the one thing that actually makes me laugh, all this bollocks, you know, Dean Smith signed this player for Brentford, Dean Smith signed this player. He doesn't sign any players for Brentford. It's not, wasn't his job. The directors of football signed the players. He will sign off on them, but, and I'm not trying to take credit away because, again, we have a lot of time for Dean Smith. Um, not tactically the most astute, uh, but a very good man, very, very good man manager. Um, I don't know again if you agree with that, but that, that was our view. We've now got somebody who is much more tactically aware, um, apart from the last two games of the season, but never mind about them. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see, you know, I, I hope you stay up. Um, I hope we come up and join you because it's, you're, you're a very easy four points a season for us. Um, we always draw at your place and beat you at well, Griffin Park, although that's obviously gone now. Um, yeah, I, I wish Villa nothing, nothing but good now. And I really, really hope that Ollie, if you've got an extra week, hopefully you've, you've got enough time to get him fit because he hasn't played. He hasn't played in pre-season. So he won't be match fit. Um, so be patient. Give him time. Don't give him stick. I know it's a lot of money, but Give him a break because he'll need it. You know, be patient. I know you're never patient. We're never, not patient either. Uh, we're upset because Ivan Tony hasn't scored a goal for us in one and a half friendlies. Um, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. But you have got a fantastic footballer there and a really good guy. So that's it, guys. Thanks. Well, I, I, yeah, I think we're all... We all were, were pretty excited anyway, but um, mm -hmm. listen to your words. We, we're expecting 15 goals a season now and top six <laughs> finish. Uh, so, <laughs> you see that pig flying up there? Um, we, we're, no. bank, we're banking on that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we've only got um, just over a minute left. But thank you very much for your time. It's very much appreciated. I think important for us to get, get a, you know, an insight from, it from a Brentford fan. So, so it's absolutely bang on. So, but listen, so very it's, much it's, appreciate it's, that. It's hopefully I've spoken a little bit of sense amongst all the rubbish, um, and I've enjoyed being on. I'll, and this is coming out what Friday? Or before um, that? So it'll be out. It'll be out tomorrow on Spotify and iTunes, and then the YouTube right. video will be out on Friday. 
Well, I shall look out for it. And if I've been edited out, I'll know that I was, was talking rubbish. But anyway, um, <laughs> all the best. And if ever I can help you, you've got my number, guys. All right? Pleasure. Thank Definitely you very awesome. much. Take care. Brilliant. Cheers. 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 Bye. Thanks, Take it easy, Thank you. Cheers. So, yeah, there we go. We've got a, a nice um, in-depth um, summary uh, about Ollie Watkins from someone who will know him a lot better than us. So I think off the back of that, Joe, do you think um, we are going to get a player that probably would fit us a lot more than than Wesley maybe and certainly Samata, someone who probably is going to fit the philosophy at Villa a bit better? Yeah, I think um, I don't want to talk about Wesley too much because I think judging him now is perhaps a bit harsh. He only had, what, half a season converting from a two-man strike force to playing as a lone striker in a completely different league at a much higher level at the age of 22. Like, I think, for me, it was a risk that we probably shouldn't have um, taken last year, but he needs to be given some time. I will, however, compare to Samantha because he's 28 and should be at his peak. For me, Ollie Watkins, over our current options, provides us with a very well-rounded striker. He doesn't necessarily excel in any one particular area, but he's just very solid at everything. Um, as was highlighted by Greville, um, pretty much even goals between head, left foot and right foot show that he's very versatile. Uh, his shot map's fantastic. It's all around the six-yard box. And something that's really impressive with him is the amount of non-penalty goals he converts per game. So it's around, it's around a goal every other game, which is very good for any striker. But where he compares really well to other championship strikers is he's converting a significantly higher number of his chances than most. So whilst Greville said that he might not be the best finisher, Actually, when you compare him to, say, Mitrovic or even Mopai, he's actually converting at quite a, quite a high rate in comparison. Roughly 20% of his shots on target go in, which when you think that Mitrovic, who's considered a reasonable finisher, is putting in around 8%, it's very impressive, really. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a good one. And um, in terms of comparison, because I've seen a lot of people... Um, mention um, certain things on, on social media about spending all this money on a championship striker. And I think one thing for me is when you look at a player who, in particular, a striker who, who posts such good stats. We're not talking about a guy who's gone and got 30 goals in non-league. They've gone and got 26 goals, including the playoffs in the division below us. And I think when you look at arguably the top end of the championship in comparison to the bottom end of the Premier League. I don't think there's a massive, massive difference. But I think when a player is posting, you know, stats like that, goals, you know, that many goals in a season, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, they've obviously got a lot of quality and I think there's a lot that we can take from that. So, obviously, people mentioning championship as if, you know, it's meaningless. You mentioned it two weeks ago, Joe, about... Um, signing players with no Premier League previous Premier League experience as opposed to signing those with Premier League experience, which on average, it's better to sign players who don't have the Premier League experience because better value for money and on average, they get more goals. So I've just had a, I had a quick look at um, the last 10 seasons in the Championship. And this was looking at the, the top scorers in the league and then how they fared in the Premier League the season after. So there are occasions, I think there's one season at least, where the top goal scorer didn't go up either with the team that he, he scored the goals with or another team didn't take a punt on him. Um, so we're just going to just go through them. So 2010-11, Danny Graham scored 24 goals in the Championship for Watford. Um, so he was averaging um, 24 in, in 45 games. So... One in just under, in, under two games, uh, which wasn't too bad. And in, in the 11-12 season for Swansea, he got 12 in 36, which isn't too bad in the Premier League. One in three. Um, and in all fairness to Danny Graham, that, that was his only decent season. Um, I think he scored six more Premier League goals since then. Um, so he's not done great. But, but obviously, point there, he's, he's, had, he's had a good goal-scoring season. He's, he's made the step up, in theory, this season after. 11-12, a guy who, who was, I'd say, fairly successful for bottom half teams anyway in the Premier League. 
Uh, Ricky Lambert, 27 goals for Southampton that season um, in 42. So a goal every just over one and a half games. Um, following season, 12-13, he got 15 in 38 um, for Southampton. So a goal every, every two and a half games. He, he's managed 31 goals in 120 Premier League games. So he's just better than a one in four man. But a guy who, who I suppose made the step up, in all fairness, I think probably renowned for being a bit of an all-round guy, brought others into the game. But but again, that season, he made he certainly made the step up. 27 in 42, so so similar to to what Ollie Watkins has done, in all fairness. Um, certainly made the step up. 12, 13, 42 games. Really, really good good season. Goal every just under one and a half games. Um Slightly skewed stats here because the following season he only, he only played 14 games because he had a cruciate, cruciate ligament injury. Uh, he got 7 17 in the 14 15 season. He scored 37 in 148 games. So he's a one in four man. So again, another player that top goal scorer, he made the step up. And again, that, that's what we're looking at. We just want to play it. We, you know, we're not expecting Ollie Watkins to come in and post 26 goals again. You know, double figures is is I think what what we'd hope to get from him. I think if your strikers getting double figures, then you, you expect us to get more points than we have done this season. Um, Thirteen fourteen season, so the top three goal scorers didn't go up, which were Ross McCormack, Jordan Rhodes, and Troy Deeney. Um, the highest scorer who did go up was Danny Ings, who got twenty one in forty, so just better than one in two. Um, following season, so for Burnley, 14-15, he scored 11 in 35. So just just um, under one in three. Um, he scored 43 in 111 games. So again, he's clearly that player is a player who clearly has made the step up into the championship. Um, I think uh, from the championship into the Premiership, I think he was really really good in the championship. Um, so I mean, d- done well. Tw- 21 in 40. So records not as good as. Um, as Ollie Watkins, but but certainly he's been able to make the, st- the step up. 14-15, Daryl Murphy uh, was the top scorer. Obviously didn't go with Ipswich. Troy Deeney, second top scorer. 21 in 42, so one in two that season. 15-16, um, he got 13 in 38 for Watford. Um, so just better than one in three. And he scored 47, 163 Premier League games. So again, just better than one in four. Um, a player who I think we can all agree has made a step up to the Premier League. Um, probably not a player, not not the most attractive in, in more sense of the words player, but has made a step up and does get the goals. Um, Fifteen, sixteen, Andre Gray. He got twenty five for Burnley and Brentford um, in forty two games, so it's just over one uh, one in one and a half games. Sixteen, seventeen. He got nine in thirty two. Not terrible. Uh, goal every three and a half games. He's got 23 and 115 Premier League games. In all fairness to Andre Gray, I don't think he's ever been a first team regular in the Premier League. He's, I think he, Watford brought him in as more of a backup um, when he when they did get him from Burnley. Um, I suppose you know he's got goals. Probably a question mark whether he's made the step up, but he's still well. He was until last season. Was still in the Premier League. Um, 16, 17. Chris Wood, 27 in 44. So just better than than um, just just over one and a half one in one and a half games. Um, Seventeen eighteen, he got ten in twenty four for Burnley. So gold every two and a half games, um, and he scored thirty five in hundred three games. Again, he's one of them that is more all rounded than just being a goal scorer. Offers a lot more than goals. Has done well for Burnley. Again, another player we can say has has made the step up. Um, this is probably the one season that stands out in terms of, of not making a step up. Um, there is one caveat that I would add. We'll move on to that once I've mentioned it. So, um, top goal scorer 17 18 was Mattia Vidra, who got uh, 21 in 40 for Derby. So, better than 1 in 2. Um, we got 1 in 13 for Burnley um, the season after, 18 <clears throat> 19. So, obviously, 1 in 13. Only played 311 minutes, um, so it equates to about what, three and a half games. So one in one in three and a half, one in four was not too bad. Um, but I think I think you know possibly I think there's big question marks over whether he's made the, the step up. Um, but again, we haven't really seen enough of him to to be able to to say whether or not he hasn't you know in the Premier League because he hasn't really played. I think he was a case 
that season Burnley got into Europe, so it's another player for them. Um, 18 19, uh, Timu Puki, 29 in 43, so better than a, a one in one and a half games, really good season. Um, scored 11 in 36 last season in what was a, a pretty poor Norwich side. Um, defensive, defensively woeful, not too bad going forward. So, you know, just off one in three, which isn't too bad um, in the Premier League. I think if you have a striker who's getting one in three, you'd be happy with that. Um, by comparison, so that season, um, Neil Morpoy and Tammy Abraham in that season in the Championship both got 25 goals in the Championship and both managed to hit double figures in the Premier League last season. Morpoy got 10 in 37, Abraham 15 in 34. So essentially, on the whole, in the last 10 seasons, the top goal scorers, those who have moved up the season after, have been able to make the step up. So, so those people who are giving it large on social media saying we spent all this money on a championship striker he's not going to be no good you know on the whole the champ these championship strikers because they have the quality in front of goal have been able to make the step up I think by no means are these players going to score you know 20-30 goals and that's, that's going to be the case for Ollie Watkins um, I think when you look at that in all fairness a lot of these players who have done well in the championship and then the season after have been playing in the Premier League a lot of these players have gone to bottom half sides. So if we have, depending on who we sign, we could be a better side than a lot of what these players have, have moved on to. So I think in all fairness, if a goal scorer is scoring as many goals as Ollie Watkins has done, then he should be able to make the step up. And, and as, as shown in that these examples, on the whole, most of these players have done. Yeah, I think... Um... That pretty much shows it about as accurately as anything else, doesn't it? That if you give good players opportunities, they tend to do well. The only, as you pointed out, the caveats being Matthias Vidra, obviously. Um, he moved to Burnley playing an entirely different style of football to what he did at Derby. And unsurprisingly, it didn't work. All the players who have moved to teams that look like a reasonably sensible fit have done well. And that, in reality, is what we're trying to do with Watkins. Yeah, I think I think with Watkins, he does, like we mentioned earlier, we spoke to Greville and, and said, I think probably, you know, Tammy Abraham works well for us because obviously he's a great, he's a good poacher, but he had a bit more of an all-round game than some of the other strikers that we had. Scott Hogan being the, the, the main one where his all-round game um, didn't really suit us the way we were playing. Ross McCormack failed. Attitude aside, he didn't really suit the way we were playing. So I think Watkins is one that, that will suit. And obviously, it'd be interesting to see um, what happens going forward. Um, so moving on to transfer talk. Obviously, um, rumours are, I suppose I say hotting up. They've never really kind of cooled down, in all fairness, for, for quite a few of them this season. Um, very briefly, we'll mention a guy that has popped up recently. Um, on social media, which is Milo Rashica. Um seems to be a name that's not going away. Episode two, Joe mentioned him in detail. Um, I think, as we've said earlier, I think in a nutshell, he probably would be, aside from Ben Rama, probably for, uh, from our point of view, probably the, the top, the top kind of winger that we've been linked with. In all fairness, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there's new, some new talk coming out from, I'm going to absolutely butcher this name, but Dice Tube, um, the sort of media outlet attached to Werder Bremen, stating that he's had a bit of a change of heart and isn't set on staying in Germany anymore. He quite likes the look of the Premier League, apparently, um, and essentially is willing to move somewhere that's going to pay him a bit more money and he's going to get more exposure. So the two clubs being touted are both Napoli and Villa currently. Um, obviously, if Napoli come in with a big offer, I think that's pretty much done and dusted with their uh, sort of European standing, although not this season. Um, but I can also see a very plausible argument to be made for coming to, a, coming to the Premier League and that being a very good way of sort of sh sh putting himself in the uh, shop window for the big Champions League clubs. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see if anything does come from that one. Um, it's one of them. I think I think with Nakamba, it was similar last season. It was one that didn't 
didn't seem to go away. It was no one in this country was was um, was mentioning it, um, and it just did go away. And obviously, we ended up signing him. So whether that turns out to be one, I don't know. But hopefully, you know, to kind of compliment Ollie Watkins, it would be great to get him in. Whether that be just him uh, or him and Ben Rama, I highly doubt we'd sign both of them. But it'd be great ambition if we did. Um, would be really good, I think, to get him in. Um, yeah. The other night. The other name that we've we've mentioned, or we mentioned it last week, me and Ian touched on. Um, that is a, another one that I suppose doesn't seem to go away. Is uh, Emmy Martinez from Arsenal? Um, I think we've, we've bid around twelve million for him. Got rejected. I think we've we've gone between fifteen and, and sixteen around that mark for him again. Which whether that's been rejected, I think that might have been rejected again. But it seems like that he wants. <laughs> to go and play first team football which I doubt he's going to get at Arsenal um, and potentially we're going to offer more money so I mean in terms of that one that would be I think I think massive for us yeah, yeah. definitely uh, that rumour circulated again today didn't it that a 17 million bid had gone in and been rejected but also the rumours yesterday were that he'd rejected a, a contract uh, renewal from Arsenal so it definitely looks like he wants first team football and that opportunity to prove himself as a number one in the Premier League. For me, it'd be the, the first choice for me out of the two that we've been sort of um, rumoured to be interested in. And you have to say it's only rumours and a lot of it is uh, Twitter sources. So how reliable it is, we don't know. But out of the two, him and Romero, yeah, did definitely anchor in towards um, Avi Martinez as my number one choice. What do you think, Joe? I mean, I think, um, if anything, there's certainly been some excitement about Emi Martinez, but I think a lot of people don't understand just how good of a shot stopper he actually is. So um, just to go off expected goals a little bit, our current keeper, Heaton, is averaging around a minus 3% in expected goals. So if you take the baseline Premier League keepers, he saves 3% less than average, which is pretty pretty sustainable like there's nothing wrong with that really he makes up for it in other elements of his game he commands the box well takes crosses really well organized as well as well he's just not perhaps the best shot stopper out there emmy martinez on the other hand saves 33 percent more than your average premier league keeper which is just absurd like there's there's one keeper who's a better shot stopper in the league and that's the reese in in fairness wenger even touted martinez the next arsenal keeper that just sort of went out the window and it, he just got shipped out on loan over and over again. And to be fair, he did really well everywhere he went. As soon as he's actually been given a chance in the Premier League, he's excelled. But Arsenal are in a bit of a uh, sticky situation. What do they do? They've got a £25 million keeper in Leno, who they've just bought in, who's been touted for their sort of immediate future on much bigger wages, coming back from an injury. Who they, let's be honest, they wouldn't be able to get rid of him at this moment in time. Martinez is much easier to ship because he's on low because of his low wages and he wants to go. It's as simple as that. He wants to play football, which I think um, as a club, we've got a real history of buying players who aren't that interested. And I think a player who's willing to take a step down from Europa League and cha challenging Champions League football to come and play consistently has got to be an exciting thing, particularly when he's performing as well as Martinez is. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when you look at those kind of figures, as well, he's, I mean, I think uh, probably a few people probably think he's younger than he is. I was surprised. Um, I mean, 28 for a goalkeeper is still young. Um, five years younger than Romero, who we've been linked with. Um, five or six years younger than Heaton as well. So in terms of longevity, that's going to be there with Martinez than anyone else. And again, I mean, he's done, he's done pretty well for all. Um, you know, no howlers, pretty solid, seems to be well, well rounded. Um, and obviously they, they, they won the FA Cup, they won the Community Shield. And by all accounts, he had, he had pretty good games in them. So it's kind of, you look at high pressure games, I know it's the FA Cup and the, Community Shield, it's not like it's Champions League final or World Cup final, but still for him, in terms of his experience at the top level, they're high-pressure games and he's come out on top and done really well. So I think for us, um, that would be a really, really good signing. 
Um, another one, another player that um, I think we, we mentioned, I don't know if we mentioned it before actually, another player that, that seems to be linked and some of the more... Um, some of the journalists who are more on the ball have suggested that, that Josh King is going to be the next guy that we're going to go in for. Um, so Josh King, obviously, uh, at Bournemouth, um, primarily recently has been a, mainly a left winger. I'd imagine that's where we'd sign him for. Um, so just going to touch on, on Josh King. Um, last season, Bournemouth obviously got relegated, but he had a who scored rating of... 6.76, which was ranked third overall last season for Bournemouth, uh, behind Ramsdale and Ake, who've since made uh, big moves elsewhere. Um, so we put him in the Villa team from last season, that would stick him sixth overall, um, joint with Wesley, but ahead of our current wingers, El Ghazi and Trezeguet. So in terms of where he'd slot in, he would be an upgrade seemingly on, on El Ghazi and Trezeguet. Uh, 24 starts, two sub appearances, which was 2033 minutes last season. Scored six goals, four assists, um, albeit he was the, the penalty taker, half of his goals were penalties. Um, average one shot per game, decent shooting accuracy, 50% shooting accuracy, conversion accuracy of 23%. So he had a better conversion rate than Ollie Watkins. Callum Wilson, who we seemingly have missed out on, and Tammy Abraham, who all Villa fans love. And in comparison to Wesley and Samata, better conversion rate than them, much better conversion rate, but then almost almost double than Wesley and, and, and Treble, Ali Samata. So in terms of a striker as well, which he, he's comfortable playing, he, he's much better in terms of his shoot accuracy and his conversion rate. Um, he had a non-penalty expected goals of six, so he matched, so he would have matched that, but obviously he got three goals. So just under that. Not too bad, I think, for a side that were struggling. Um, you know, he's done reasonably well coming off the left. Um, key passes per 90, 1.3, which doesn't seem much, but in comparison to our strikers, is better than both Wesley and Samata, who Wesley's 0.55, Samata 0.84. In comparison to the wingers, El Ghazi 1.3, Trezeguet 0.97. So in terms of as a striker or as a winger, He's contributing more key passes, um, which I think, going back to Ollie Watkins, that's going to be helpful in terms of he if he comes off the left, then you look at it from A, for his Grealish to go in the middle, and B, a bit more of a, an outlet, creative outlet for Ollie Watkins. So I think that would go quite well. Um, you look at his goals from last season, um, three penalties, his other three goals were in the box, bit of a poacher in all fairness. Um and he obviously playing off the left, he comes inside off the left. He isn't afraid to have a shot from outside the box. He looks like a handful all the time and somebody that not always going to have a great output in terms of goals and, uh, and assists, but got that pace to get in behind. So he offers that. But also, he does hassle defenders. And I think it was um, evident in the game against us early season in our first home game. And I think he was pivotal to sort of them scoring the first two goals but both sort of defensive errors but um, in terms of them getting up the pitch and being direct in their play it was quite pivotal to that Yeah I, I do like his work rate my big concern with him is really I don't view him as a particularly great winger and I don't view him as a particularly great striker he's sort of okay at both Overall, he's one of those weird ones that fits in as a very talented player. And as an overall player, yeah, he's obviously a better player than, say, Callum Wilson. But when you, if you take purely his wing performances, for example, he doesn't actually sort of stand out against El Ghazi, which is kind of worrying. Like, dribble-wise, relatively similar percentages. The thing that he is better at is he is a better finisher. But he doesn't create that much for a winger. And as an out-and-out striker, he doesn't score that many. I don't see where he really fits in. Mm. Interesting what Greville was saying about Watkins. Because he's very two-footed and he does distribute his goals out well between right, left and headers. And obviously he didn't score any penalties last season because he's not a penalty due to. But saying that the key thing for me was he said he needed 
to have those two around him. So in that 4-3-3 formation, he needed to have those two players close to him to get the best out of himself. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to be key for us this year. Um, it was something we did really badly last year. The only time we managed to really get anyone close to our striker was when Grealish was out wide left, which I assume is why he played so much there through the season. Yeah. Um, Very The frustration, wasn't it, of the first half of the season that everybody had identified that Wesley was totally isolated when he was getting the ball. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was completely isolated. And unfortunately, he isn't good enough at that to make up for it on his own. Yeah. Like, there are certain strikers who can do that. Like Giroud can play that role with no one near him and hold the ball up for what seems like forever. But to ask a lad who's only ever played in Belgium as a second striker to come in and do that in the Premier League at 22 is a big ask. I imagine. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, I think with Wesley's, I, I get the feeling that they, they tried to go with a player that had similar attributes to Tammy Abraham in terms of that he's decent with his back towards goal, but he's also relatively decent with his form and scores goals. I think that's, that's probably why they went for Wesley. Um, I'd imagine similar for Watkins, as we mentioned earlier. But again, the big concern is, I think it's always been a concern, is what wingers we bring in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We need some actual quality. We need players who are not just creative and not just a goal threat. We need complete package players. It's when, so it's why I'm not hugely excited by the prospect of playing like Josh King on the wing, because I think he's a much better second striker than he is a winger. Um, yeah. And that, that's when, it, when I say I don't necessarily view him as a great fit for us, it's not that I don't think he's a good player. If you're playing two strikers, he's brilliant. But if you're either playing him as a centre forward or a winger, I think there are better players to fill those roles. And the fact he's 29 on top, uh, it, it, it just doesn't sit for me, that one. I think um, we've highlighted players previously in the likes of Rashidza, Ben Rama, Wendia, um, who would be absolutely brilliant for to play off a player like Watkins. Yeah, I think How old no. is um, Rashidza? Sorry? How old is Rashidza in comparison? 24. 24. So that would fit the model that sort of Villa seem to be going for, the, yeah. the younger developing them further for potential sell-on or sort of getting us to the next stages of our I development as a club. I imagine the only concern with Rashidza is that he, around all of our current signings and players, there's been this sort of idea that Villa is their big step. This is the club they really want to play for. And I think it's fairly apparent to anyone with eyes that that isn't it for Rashidza. But if he came, it would be to put himself in the shop window for a Liverpool, for a Chelsea, for one of those sort of top Champions League clubs. Personally, I'm OK with that. If we get a good couple of years out, if he performs well enough to go to one of those clubs, I'm more than happy, I've got to say. Yeah, I mean, if we are, it's one of them, like we said before, it's not going away. But if we are definitely interested in him, it fits what Land is as and previously at Copenhagen, was get players in, use the club as a second stone, and then go and play elsewhere in Europe. So I'm with you. I'm happy for him to come in and do that because if he is successful enough to move to a better club, you know, Liverpool's, Chelsea's, etc., it's going to have played really well for us to get that move. So then, essentially, we'd be in a better position to then move on and see who else is out there. Um, so I think that, that would work well, but we definitely need. Well, I'm with you. I like Josh King, but he's one of them. He's, he's not a quality winger. He's not a quality striker. I think I'd like to have him because he's, he offers a bit of something. You know, his versatility, I suppose. He's a decent winger, decent striker. You know, you wouldn't have him probably not his first choice. He'd be better than El Ghazi, possibly. Yeah, I, I think I think you um, hit the nail on the head there. Versatility is what he offers. And if we could afford a £20 million sub striker, he would be up, right up there as one of my picks. I just don't think we can afford that sort of cash to not 
I mean, he fills a, fills a specific role at the moment. Yeah, no, bang on. I don't think, um, I think the other um, players linked, John Swift is probably the only one. Um, can't really comment on that one too much. I'm not really seeing enough of him, but um, I think in terms of solid uh, links, I think we've, we've covered them all really. Obviously, we've mentioned the, the current signings. So um, we'll, we'll end this week's episode there. So, obviously, a, a massive thanks to our special guest from earlier um, who spoke to us about Brentford. So, thanks to that, Greville, if you're watching and listening. Um, again, a massive thank you to Joe and to Ian. Thanks for coming on again, guys. Thank you very much for Always having me. And a massive thank you from me. I'm Chris Ellis. We're Villa Together. You can listen to our podcast via iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and many others. We also have a video available on YouTube that shows various graphics and other. Any questions, send them through to us via Twitter or Instagram at Villa Together or by email villatogether at gmail.com. So once again, thank you very much. I'm Chris Ellis and we're Villa Together.